O sea. Greater than 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. Liquid water is approximately 98% of that, of which most of it is salt water. So we can't actually use that because it's salt water. Um, and ice is approximately 2% uh, of all the water. And that's just a breakdown here down the bottom. Um, it's showing you that this percentage here, which is about 2.5%, is fresh water which is available. But of that, 76% is ice caps and glaciers so we don't have access to that and accessible water is this very very small amount here that we can actually access and drink of that this is then divided into this much being in the atmosphere this much being in freshwater lakes and this much being groundwater um, so when you look at it that way there's not a lot of water that's actually available to us Water is essential for life, and without water, uh, we wouldn't exist. And that's basically when they went to Mars. They sent the probe up to Mars to see if um, there was any life on Mars. They were looking for water. Most animals and plants contain more than 60% water. The human body is about 72% of water, and that will vary. It is essential for the transport of nutrients and wastes, for heating and cooling, for photosynthesis and as I said before it's the presence of the gaseous or frozen water it was a positive sign of um, the existence of life when they were looking at Mars this is something you probably learnt about earlier and even in primary school and this is the water cycle and you can see here water evaporates comes out of the ocean and evaporates forms clouds it rains it goes back down and this is the water cycle, round and around and around it goes. The structure of water. The structure of water gives it its unique physical properties. When you think water, you think H2O, and it's a polar molecule. It's got an oxygen on one end and a hydrogen on the other end, and this will in turn give it hydrogen bonding with itself and with other uh, molecules and ionic compounds as well, but we'll discuss that later. So here we've got the oxygen, we've got the hydrogen. The oxygen has a greater electronegativity, so the electrons move more towards the oxygen, giving it a delta negative charge, with the two hydrogens being a delta positive charge. This, of course, means that it can hydrogen bond with other positives and negatives. So you can see here the hydrogen is attracted to the delta negative on the oxygen. And water can actually bond with two, oh sorry, four other water molecules because it has the lone pair of electrons as well. So you've got pretty much two delta negatives sitting there and you've got the two delta positives on the hydrogen. So it can bond to four other um, uh, water molecules. This is important when we're looking at the properties and the first one I'd like to discuss is the expansion of water upon freezing. So in an ice crystal, water molecules are arranged in a structured and regular pattern and it looks like this. Each water molecule can form hydrogen bonds with four other water molecules and this is what I was talking about before because, and I'll just flip back for a moment, because you've got the two lone pairs of electrons sitting on the oxygen, you can um, the, each of these hydrogens can form a, a, a hydrogen bond with these two lone pairs. So we've got an oxygen with its two lone pairs, and we've got the hydrogen coming off it. The hydrogen, of course, gets its delta positive. And we've, in effect, got two delta negatives here. This will mean that this one can attach to one hydrogen. Oh, we'll make it into a different colour there. I don't think that's going to rub out. Um, let's go for green, see if that makes a difference. So we're forming a hydrogen bond here with another hydrogen on a water. This one will form with another hydrogen on a water. And this one, of course, will form with an oxygen. 
and this one will form with an oxygen. So it can uh, bond or hydrogen bond with four other um, water molecules. So it's this regular pattern which causes an increase in volume because these form this crystalline structure. They actually push each other out and it creates pockets of air inside that which gets trapped. Um, this will cause a decrease in density and an increase in volume. And you saw that in the experiment or basically when you were putting ice, um, you put water into the freezer and you saw that you had an increase of about a mil. Um, you also saw that when you put the increase, oh, sorry, the decrease in density, um, when you put ice blocks in water, the ice will float. And there you go, ice floats. Okay, so when you've got water molecules which are in liquid form, they still attract to one another, um, but they're moving around really quickly, so they don't form these strong or these crystalline patterns. But when it's in solid form, they form these quite sturdy structures, uh, which are hexagonal, that's the word I'm trying, hexagonal structures. And you can see that these are further apart than these water molecules are. And we look here at a nice graph which shows the variation in density. So you can see here ice has quite a low density. When it melts, the density shoots right up to almost a density of 1, which is what we perceive water's density as being. And we're talking when we're talking density in grams per mil. So it's how much it weighs per mil. So you can see here that ice is about 10% less dense than water is. And that was shown too when we were looking at how much of the ice block um, floats above the water. High melting points and boiling points. Heat needs to be supplied or energy needs to be supplied to break the hydrogen bonds in the water molecule. And if we have a look at hydrogen here, or sorry, water here, we'll see that water has a very much higher melting point than all of these other molecules, whoops, all of these other molecules here. One would expect that as your molecular mass increases, that your melting points would increase. And this is what happens. This is due to more dispersion forces um, and more attraction between electrons. Uh, or there's more electrons, so there's more attraction. However, water is a lot higher than these other molecules which have a higher molecular mass. And the reason being is because of the hydrogen bonds. Energy needs to be supplied to break these strong hydrogen bonds. Remember, they're still hydrogen bonds. They're not covalent bonds. They're not ionic, but they are the stronger of the intermolecular bonds. Because um, they... I'll show you in the next graph, actually. You can see here in comparison to hydrogen fluoride or ammonium, um, they water still has a much, much, much higher boiling point. And you might sort of look and say, well, this is hydrogen bonding and this is hydrogen bonding. Why aren't these affected? This is because water is unique in the fact that I showed earlier that each water can hydrogen bond with four other waters. Whereas if you look at hydrogen fluoride, you've only got one hydrogen there and you've got three lone pairs of electrons. Or with ammonia here, you've got um, one lone pair of electrons and you've got the three hydrogens. So you can't get that perfect symmetry that water does, that it can bond with four other water molecules. Okay, latent heat, high latent heat. Okay, the latent heat is the amount of heat needed to change the state of a substance. And here we have the latent heat of fusion, which is the amount of energy needed to convert a fixed amount of water from a solid at zero degrees to a liquid at zero degrees. So it's talking about changing the state of the substance without actually changing the temperature of the substance. So if we're looking at the latent heat of fusion, it is the energy needed to change water from solid 
at zero degrees to liquid at zero degrees. So the temperature is not increasing. It is just the conversion of the state. So it's changing from a solid to a liquid. Here we've got the latent heat of vaporization. So the latent heat of vaporization is the amount of energy um, needed to convert a fixed amount of water from a liquid at zero, uh, 100 degrees to a gas at 100 degrees. So again, this is not talking about changing temperature. The water is staying at 100 degrees Celsius. And as it converts to a gas, the gas is still 100 degrees Celsius, but it's changing states from liquid to gas. And a large amount of energy is needed to break the hydrogen bonds. So if we look at it here, and this is a lovely little graph that shows the latent heat of water. So we're at minus 50 degrees, and of course that's an ice or a solid. So as the temperature of ice increases, it absorbs heat to energy. So the solid particles are moving faster and faster and faster and faster. When they get to zero degrees, you don't see a rise in temperature straight away because what's happening is those solid uh, particles of ice need to absorb energy to break those hydrogen bonds or to yeah, to break those hydrogen bonds. So it's an absorption of latent, it's called the latent heat of fusion. So it's breaking, it's changing state. It's going from a solid to a liquid without temperature rising. So part C here is the liquid rising in temperature. So heat's being given to it and it rises in temperature until it reaches 100 degrees. And then you have this very, very long latent heat of vaporization. This is when the water is boiling and imagine the amount of energy, well you don't have to imagine it, you can see it here, it's from 800 and say 900 joules through to 3,900, oh, sorry 2,000, say 3,100 joules. That much energy is needed to break those bonds so that the water molecules can free themselves and become gaseous, which is part E. So steam absorbs heat and thus it starts increasing temperature. But all of this is needed, this energy, for the water molecule to actually break the hydrogen bonds and become free and become a gas. High specific heat. Water has a high specific heat. And a high specific heat is the amount of energy required to change the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So it's the amount of energy required to change the temperature of a gram of substance by one degree Celsius. And there you go. Okay, the specific heat of water is 4.2 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So it's the amount of energy per gram to change degree Celsius. So if we have a look here and compare it to other um, substances, you'll see that water has a very high specific heat capacity. We did that experiment where we heated up ethanol and water and we saw that ethanol rose a lot more quickly in temperature and then decreased a lot more quickly in temperature and that was showing you that water is able to retain its heat um, a lot more than ethanol does and if we look at other things like metals or even sand um, they, they don't have as high a heat capacity A high specific heat is really important to water because it means that it can absorb large amounts of heat energy before it begins to get hot. It releases heat energy slowly when situations cause it to cool and this allows for the moderation of the Earth's climate and this is absolutely vital in why the Earth functions and why the Earth became the Earth, I guess. It also helps organisms regulate their body temperature more effectively. Think about sweating. If you're wet um, from sweat or from water, if you've just been in the pool, that water uh, absorbs your energy 
um, and makes you feel cooler. That's what being feeling cooler is, is about the water absorbing that energy. Think about a lake of uh, water as well. Um, and when it gets iced over, um, it doesn't change temperatures that rapidly. You think about the sea. The sea only changes a couple of degrees in temperature over summer and winter, and that's more got to do with um, the tidal patterns and the ocean currents. Um, think of a swimming pool or a lake too. If you know, it takes a lot, a lot, a lot of time for it to turn into ice. Even here, you can see the snow all around, and there's no ice. This is because it can absorb a large amount of heat energy before it begins to warm up. And again, it will release heat energy slowly when situations cause it to cool. This is also really important uh, when you get down to the beach, for instance. Um, I spoke about this in class, that at the beach or coastal places have more regulated temperatures. So the difference between their day and their night temperature isn't as huge as say if you go into the desert. If you go into the desert you might have 45 degrees during the day and you know five degrees or even zero degrees at night whereas if you go by the ocean on a normal day you're probably looking at about you know 25 degrees during the day and what you know say 15 degrees overnight so you've only got that 10 degrees change in temperature. That's because of the water there it can absorb large amounts of heat energy during the day and it releases heat energy slowly. So it helps the moderation of the Earth's climate.